cool. nothing i always say nothing quite says christmas like um infectious disease so <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly um it's the the one of the wonders of sharing yeah <laughs> <laughs> You Just. better watch out, you better not pout, you better not cry, I'm telling you why. Prescription <laughs> sound is coming to town. To town. <laughs> Hello and welcome back listeners to the podcast where we mix things up with a special festive Christmas intro. The brains behind such a smooth jingle is also my guest today on the show, Matthias Pautner from the lab of Christian Anderson here at Scripps Research. Now, despite the jovial intro, today's special is nevertheless a very important one, as we discuss their truly life-changing work on the study of tropical diseases. We start by joining Matthias as he recounts his late high school biology classes, which really sparked his initial interest in the immune system. We had like a whole term on the immune system, and I just thought it was really cool because it was such a complex system, and I think that's what kind of got me interested in it in the first place. And then I went to study molecular biotechnology in Munich, which was more or less biochemistry. And then I did a master's in molecular and cell biology, which brought me to Atlanta. So that was sort of like my foray into the oh, US okay. for like a year. Yeah, but I, I think I was always fascinated in the in the immune system because of the complexity. And it's so cool, right, that we can like fend off all these uh, onslaught of bacteria and viruses that are coming for us. And I think that is also what eventually brought me sort of like into the realm of like viral diseases, right? Because there's people who are doing more basic immunology. We have like our T cells subset enthusiasts and phosphorylation <laughs> pathway aficionados. And uh, but for me, it was always <laughs> into like you know how can you how can you cope with something as simple as like a virus um, that has maybe like a ten thousand base per genome like HIV, right? nine g's and is very well equipped to kind of get you into major trouble right yeah and i guess that was your pathway then into scripts because this is such a hub of hiv work yeah so it, it, that was sort of really with uh, a lot of luck also I, I was in a german phd program that was designed to in, in, in immunology and through that program we were allowed to do a three months internship and i did that internship in dennis burton's lab by the end of it, right, um, I think I really liked it a lot. And so they sort of like hinted that, you know, if I wanted to stay, maybe we could arrange that. And I briefly went back. But then at some point, I sort of hit Dennis up and was like, remember when you said that I could come back at any time? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then You were uh, just being nice. Yeah. Were you serious? Yeah, yeah. And so he put a good word in for me with Jamie Williamson. And uh, I guess the rest is history. Wow. That's yeah. very cool. So what were you doing uh, in his lab? I believe you were in, in uh, vaccines, right? Yeah. So we work on vaccines to HIV um, that are antibody based. Okay. And so they're, they're, I guess those are like the two big categories. There's people that work on, on T-cell mediated vaccines. And then there's people who think that antibodies have to do the job in the case of HIV. And I obviously believe that that's the true path. Yeah, <laughs> we will have our teams. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, so the thing with HIV is right, that in principle, once you have like infected cells, right, um, it's kind of hard to control because the virus can go into that latent phase and so it can become dormant. Yeah. And so ideally you want to prevent infection in the first place and yeah. what we call sterilizing immunity. And the only thing that can really do that for you is antibodies because T cells only come in like after cells are infected. So the major challenge with HIV is right, that it mutates incredibly fast uh, on the one hand, and then on the other hand, that is, is very elusive uh, regarding the immune system. So it has a couple of tricks um, on its surface to kind of evade uh, immune pressure. And um, because of that, it's very hard for the immune system that make, to make antibodies that hit very uh, conserved regions on the virus that can change a lot. And um, sometimes when people are infected over multiple years, that does happen. And we have uh, isolated antibodies from these people, and we call that broadly neutralizing antibodies. Okay, yeah. And so what the focus in Dennis's lab is, is A, sort of like to isolate and characterize these antibodies, and then B, to come up with vaccination strategies that would you, give you such a broadly neutralizing antibody. And you recently had a paper out, I believe, from your time in it, uh, the Burton lab. Yeah, it's it's so recent that it's actually next Tuesday. Oh, 
perfect. <laughs> so, so whenever this airs, we were, it might it might be a great primer for people to exactly. So go it's, read that. It's, it's um, I just confirmed with the editors this morning. It's going to come out on December eleventh. Okay. We took a couple of these experimental vaccine candidates um, that um, uh, collaborators of ours um, made. So we, in the previous study, we had immunized, um, I think it was like a total of 140 rhesus macaques with different sort of like flavors of that protein and, and with different doses where we were basically trying to kind of find out what is a good way to immunize like a very close to clinical model system um, to get a good neutralizing antibody response. And then now as the follow-up, we kind of took monkeys that had very good neutralizing antibody responses, and then we had a group with low neutralizing antibody responses, and we then repeatedly challenged these monkeys with uh, like a variant of HIV virus to find out if the neutralizing antibodies would actually be able to protect from infection. And so we looked at all of these parameters, and what we found is really that neutralizing antibodies are able to do it if there is a high enough quantity of them. Mm -hmm. And so we basically watched in our monkeys as the neutralizing antibody titers went down, they became more and more or more and more of them became infected. And so now we could establish um, a certain threshold of antibody titer that you need in the blood for protection. And we hope that the study will help as a benchmark sort of in the field of kind of like what we need to reach in order to protect also potentially in a clinical setting or we can compare that to clinical studies that are underway to kind of also see how well our experimental model systems match up with what's happening in the clinical realm. Yeah, that's fascinating. I remember that figure in the paper where you have the nice kind of infection probability going down as the serum antibodies are increasing. Yeah. yeah. And how variable is that threshold? And particularly with um, either gender or like age, are you seeing big differences there? And do you think that's going to play out in humans too? So we have not... um, We had a limited number of animals in that study, but we did control for age and gender between like our high and low antibody titer groups. And we didn't see a difference that would stick, but with the caveat that we were not powered to detect differences in age or gender. So we'd have to have like much more animals, I guess, to do that. But the expectation is that the antibody titer itself should be predictive. After this HIV work for his PhD, Matthias has now moved into studying tropical diseases for his postdoc in Christian Andersen's lab. Their lab is part of this immunology consortium called the CVISB, an amazing large-scale collaboration between Scripps Research and other labs across the US and Africa, which aims to combat these serious infections. Right, so the, 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 the CVISB is the Center for Viral uh, Systems Biology of which uh, Christian Anderson, my boss, is the, the head PI at Scripps. So it's a, it's a U19 cluster, which has uh, another co-PI at uh, Tulane University, which is Bob Gary. And then we have a couple of technology cores and like a modeling core that will help us do the analysis that we want to do. And so the overall mission of this uh, of the CVSB is uh, we're asking some fairly simple questions, which is when we look at these viral hemorrhagic fevers, like Ebola and Lassa fever in specific, which are all in, in like endemic. Lassa fever is endemic in West Africa, and then Ebola sp- sporadically pops up in outbreaks, as currently in Congo. So we wanna add, we basically just ask the question: Why do some people die from infection, and why other people survive? Why do some people develop these severe sequelae? Why others do not? And um, we want to tackle that with like a really new approach, which is a systems biological approach, which we think is necessary because so traditionally people look either at like the, the host side, which is your immune response, to see if something is up there, maybe with your T cell response or um, with your antibody responses and so forth. And then other people usually look at uh, viruses and see does the virus have any particular mutations, you know, that make it specifically more infectious or more virulent and and so forth. And we're trying to kind of do everything on the immune system side as well as on the virus side. And then with the help of like um, statisticians in a a modeling core, we're trying to bring it down and then see if we see patterns that can really explain why some people survive and others don't. So how is the time generally spent between, say, Zika 
you know, Lassa, Ebola, um, and how does it shift depending on you know, like the outbreak or kind of the severity? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. So the the, uh, the CVSB works only on Lassa and Ebola, but we have other projects in the lab on Zika and okay. on West Nile virus currently. And so I want to say that there is different people working on different projects. Like we have uh, two graduate students that spend most of their time on uh, Zika and West Nile. And then uh, we have currently two postdocs, myself included, uh, we spend our days with uh, mostly Lassa fever and some Ebola work. And then uh, we have another couple people that were considered general pathogen detection. Like if you would just sort of sequence a sick person uh, to be able to identify what, what, kind of, what the infection is in like a very quick time to kind of inform clinical decisions. Gotcha. So you're modeling this in animals as well as using samples from the, the human patients that you're getting from the field? We're in the lab, we're only measuring samples that we collect in the field on, on research trips that we do. Um, but we have collaborators uh, that uh, uh, that do animal experimentation. The problem there is that all of this, for especially for Lassa and Ebola, is BSL-4 work. So that's the higher, the highest biosafety level, right? Because okay. these, there's no cure and uh, both these diseases are fairly lethal. And so this has to be done in... Uh, um, we have one group that does it at US Emirate at, uh, in Washington, D.C. at the NIH. And then there's another group at uh, UTMB Galveston. And they have uh, the equipment and the facilities to do animal research. With your human work, when you're looking at the possible characteristics that dictate whether someone is a survivor of one of these deadly infections, mm -hmm. what kind of things are you finding? And are you seeing whether... If someone survives an infection, does it necessarily mean that the symptoms weren't severe? Or are you seeing people that might have really, really severe symptoms but end up actually surviving the, the disease? It's the latter. So there, there's a couple of things to be said there. So generally speaking, yes, when people come to the hospital, they tend to have fairly severe symptoms, which... Um, is can like high fever spikes, severe diarrhea, vomiting, then there can be bleeding. And some people survive and others don't. There's no, for example, bleeding, which, you know, it's just a symptom that people usually pick up on because it's sort of idiosyncratic to some of these uh, fevers, um, is not a good predictor of whether or not people are going to survive. So people that have bleeding during infection can make it, cannot make it. One thing that is sort of interesting to point out is that so some of the uh, lethality rates for these diseases are pretty high, between like 15 and 80 percent of infected people. But the, a caveat that is sort of emerging right now is that this seems to pertain mostly to people that actually do arrive at a hospital, right, where that is measured. And um, sure. people now going into villages to see how high the seroprevalence rates are meaning how many people have had this disease at some point in the past. And so the preliminary uh, analysis there indicate that probably a good amount of the population, at least in some regions, right, may have had Lassa fever, for example, which would indicate that there's probably different severities of disease progression overall with only the most severe ending up in a hospital mm -hmm. um, so that's something that we'll also want to look at in the setting of our study. Now, with such hands-on work in the field, this means that Matthias and his colleagues are traveling a good amount to West Africa in areas where there is a high prevalence of these infections. As well as the scientific work itself, this can present a number of other challenges. We're doing our next trip to uh, Sierra Leone, Nigeria. It's just, you know, like getting everything packed up and ready and knowing what we want to do. And... Um, Getting a visa from Nigeria, a business visa, is not trivial. So I had to do an impromptu trip to LA to go to one of their offices. Yeah, how was that whole process? Because a lot of people don't appreciate all these extra things that go into yeah. you know, traveling. No, it, it's crazy. I think like basically the majority of my last week went into like sort of non-scientific work just to kind of get everything on the rails. My gosh, so how often are you doing that? And do you need visas for everywhere you're going? Yeah, you do. And usually you need business visas. And our first trip was in uh, June, July, where I went for almost four weeks to Sierra Leone. And so there I have now, I think my visa is valid for two years. But okay. for example, Nigeria, depending on what citizenship you are, right, they only give you like a three-month visa. So you basically have to apply every time oh, you're going. Man. 
Yeah. God, and you're a foreign, you're a foreign uh, postdoc too, so you've got all your own own uh, international visa stuff to keep up with. Yeah, Same that's the idea. other thing. Like between maintaining legal status and like getting into the countries we need to go, that it's definitely taking some some effort. And then a lot of it is also just coordinating with the people that are there, right? So that mm. things are ready when you go there. So you described some of the countries that you're working in, and I'm guessing a lot is dictated by how severely those areas are affected by the disease. Um, but what are the other factors? Because I'm imagining the infrastructure over there must be quite different between countries. And I think you mentioned things like um, just transport and safety can be quite challenging in some of these places. Yeah, so it really depends highly from country to country. Like Sierra Leone, for example, is relatively safe, I would say while Nigeria is definitely you have to kind of be aware of where you are and how you're getting there and security has to be arranged. Um, I guess generally the infrastructure in these countries, I mean, I think before my first trip to Sierra Leone, I did a little bit of like research online, right? And I think some like 7% of the roads are paved. The rest is not. Most of people live in more like um, these mud houses, um, especially outside the capital of Freetown. And I think this is also worth mentioning that uh, a lot of the work that we're doing right could be in in good parts prevented by better infrastructure. Mm. Like Lassa fever in specific is a zoonotic disease that spreads from uh, rats or mastomums to humans. And so what happens is that these rats get into the houses of people that live there and then uh, eat some of the food or like uh, pee on the food and then people can eat the contaminated oh. food or sometimes they, they also uh, hunt the rats because meat is so scarce. And so, for example, if they had better houses, right, uh, that would go a long way. But um, since that is sort of like outside of the realm, what we can immediately affect, we're doing our best to kind of help mitigate the, the causes. Yeah, sure. A lot of this falls into kind of political and economic realms as yeah. well, right? So Absolutely. Cool. So you guys must be really be keeping your ear to the ground and monitoring the disease uh, status in these countries. So what is the relationship between labs like you and public health authorities? So what is that kind of general response if there's a really severe outbreak? Yeah, so this is, I think, a rather new development that you have researchers on the ground during an outbreak, right, that can sort of like in real time inform some of the decision making, Mm. and which came about with like... uh, Uh, First of all, like next generation sequencing, right? And then these technologies becoming more and more portable. Um, Like now we have these nanopore sequencers, the Minion, that you can literally, they're like handheld, more or less, um, which open up a lot of possibilities there. Yeah, so um, there's a couple of great historical examples. Uh, One of them is certainly the Ebola outbreak, where, um, for example, at the site that we work at in Sierra Leone, which is in Kanama, that's the capital of the southeastern province. They diagnosed the first case of Ebola there in 2014. And so the analysis showed that the, the virus came from Guinea to Sierra Leone in May 2014. And then uh, there was a lot of sequencing happening there that was shared with the local authorities. And then that was published already in August in Science the same year. And so this was a very, very rapid turnaround. And in other ways, I mean, there's a lot that can be learned from viral sequencing during these outbreaks, right? Because this information can also be used, for example, for vaccine design, because you know the actual strains that are circulating. It can help you understand the modes of uh, transmission across geographic barriers. For example, sometimes in Nigeria, they found that the rivers posed natural barriers to the spread of certain viral strains where it couldn't cross. And all of this can inform like the public health response to a disease outbreak in ideally more or less in real time. Right. Yeah, and it's funny. You mentioned the, the rapid turnover of the kind of information then getting published. And this is something I wanted to touch on because it must, with so many labs coming together and such heavy collaboration to reach this common goal, it must present a unique environment in terms of um, intellectual property and data sharing. So how does that play out? Are there certain incentives or agreements in place between different labs? Yeah, 
So first of all, I think the very large parts of the viral hemorrhagic fever community is just they're really amazing people and they understand that this information is more about um, scientific glory, right? That there's like actual lives at stake with how fast this information is shared or not. And so there are platforms. Um, one of them is, for example, like a form that's called Virological, where sequencing data is shared more or less in real time. And so sort of we do this with the understanding that we're not scooping each other, but that eventually that information will help aid the authorities. And then, you know, the other thing is like you can also then compare your sequences to the sequences that other labs generated and see how that all fits together in like a tree. We had instances where there was like some uh, minor mistakes in something that we had deposited and people have picked up on that and pointed that out and vice versa. So I think there is a lot of upsides. In large, people understand that this is really important and uh, it's really a priority for us. For the, the CVIs, be the mission is that everything we measure um, that pertains sort of to the human health, we want to share within a week. Wow. And the force behind that is Christian. Christian is a, is, is a true believer in real-time data sharing, and um, we're streamlining on all ends uh, to make that happen. Wow, that's fantastic. So Christian, so your lab and uh, Christian in particular is very involved with the uh, translational branch of scripts, right. both being very close to you know, Eric Topol and then all this, uh, this work with, with humans. So I wanted to get your take on the application of digital medicine to infectious disease going forward in the future. What do you think that landscape is going to look like? It's happening. Yeah? Right now. Yeah? I have just the project for you. <laughs> Please. <laughs> so I know you had a great uh, Steve Steinhubel I did. On, on the podcast. So we actually have a collaboration with Steve, right? Steve works with a lot of uh, variable devices yeah. um, that measure heart rate and uh, some measure blood pressure and, and, and whatnot. And so... One project that we're just ramping up, we, we have a current trial in Sierra Leone and on my next trip in January, we're going to build that out, is that in the last award, right, you have to imagine this is literally rooms with like regular bats in it. This is nothing like yeah. a, a a North American uh, ICU, right? There's no digital surveillance equipment whatsoever. And it's a barrier to the nurses, right? Because every time you go in the ward, you have to gown up completely in like a, a, a hazmat suit, um, which is very cumbersome. There's not necessarily always AC, right? That's uncomfortable. And so the, the frequency with which caregivers go into the patient rooms is, you know, at best, I want to say maybe every hour or two. This is one point where we said we could intercept with like variable devices, so what we started to do with, in collaboration with a company called PhysIQ, um, they use patches called Vital Patch that you can put on a patient and then with a Bluetooth connection with a nearby phone, you can read out the heartbeat, the respiratory rate, um, the, so the, the physical motion activity, um, as well as the, the skin temperature. And so we're working on getting basically a patch on every LASA patient that comes in and then having phones at the nursing station so that the nurses can in real time monitor the patients and have a sense when they can go in there um, uh, to intervene when the patient is in distress on the one hand side. And then uh, at the same time, we're also collecting these data um, on servers of uh, PhysIQ. And so then... Later on, we want to go in with like machine learning algorithms and, uh, and and other tools to see if we can find pattern in the C's progression that we could uh, then leverage to kind of improve the standard of care with uh, early warning systems when a patient might be in decline and stuff like that. Yeah, I was going to ask that. Did those markers correlate? very well with infection severity we're only getting the first data in now so it's yeah. it's too early to to tell but the expectation is right that if you spike a fever and your heart rate is going to go through the roof that probably something is up so we'll we'll i'll have to come back in a year next christmas and then i'll, I'll tell you how it went yeah you can give us an update on the show why <laughs> <laughs> did i have any listeners at that point <laughs> maybe this thing will have been buried <laughs> Right. Yeah, no, I was wondering if maybe in the not-too-distant future we might have sensors that 
you know, can read out our broadly neutralizing antibodies in the serum. <laughs> I, uh, I predict that this is probably still a little bit further in the future because that's not a trivial uh, essay to do. But yeah, yeah I mean, the, the overall prospects of digital medicine are fantastic, right? Uh, to kind of keep closer tabs on, on patients. And it can be really like uh, the difference between life or death yeah. without being overly traumatic. So moving away from the lab, um, how do you generally enjoy spending your time? And I say that with a smirk because I've seen you at the symphony once or twice. Yeah. So I know I, you're into music. I've seen you at the symphony once or twice. <laughs> so I think I forget was the first one at the when we saw each other first at the Star Wars concert. Oh yes, yeah, we did. Yeah, that was good. That yeah, was the San Diego Symphony uh, played the 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 soundtrack to A New Hope. Which is two of my hobbies right there, Star Wars and the... Yeah, Matthias was dressed up. I should tell you, he was in a full Darth Vader suit that, that night. I, I, I categorically deny these allegations. <laughs> no, so yeah, I, I, I play guitar and a little bit of piano. So music has always been um, a great um, pastime of mine. Otherwise, um, some sports, right? And I think uh, postdoc takes basically takes care of the rest. So Yeah, for sure. Right. Yeah, you said you guys had uh, music nights at your place, right? Yeah, we do do that yeah. sometimes. So we, we call it art nights, but we have um, a bunch of people over, many of them being uh, students and postdoc at Scripps here. And then uh, a couple of people draw things or like wow. color and, and others, um, people that play instruments, right? We kind of jam together a little bit. So that's usually good fun. Yeah, I think you invite me. I'm, I'm not sure I'd have much to offer. Maybe I could just play the triangle in the corner or... <laughs> It, absolutely Every, everybody is welcome yeah i can make the drinks i can make an old-fashioned so i could be the barman for the night we, we do appreciate old fashions as well Great. it's another hobby uh, yeah yeah like we have a wall stock bar very good so maybe i'll end with my final question and my my favorite question i hope you've given it some thought mm -hmm. which is if you could give one piece of advice your golden piece of wisdom to anybody in the realm of uh, work career progression life, health, self-improvement, anything, what do you think it would be and why? One, one thing that I, I will say, I think in the beginning of my PhD, I struggled a lot with the fact that I always thought that there are people that are very, very good at sort of like sitting by themselves and kind of chipping away at a really hard problem and um, can sort of like go all in on that. And I was sort of worried if you're somebody that is maybe a little bit more social and that likes to interact with people more, if there's sort of like a place for you in science as well with that. And uh, I had the great opportunity both in Dennis's lab and now in, uh, in Christian's lab, work in these great consortia, which are very collaborative. So this is, I guess, an encouragement to, to people that might feel a little bit alienated that um, I think nowadays there's a lot of great stuff that can be done in collaboration. When you have something that a collaborator can do for you, I'm always inclined to kind of source things out and then tie things up uh, together and have a lot of experts that contribute. Yeah, I totally agree. I think it's that that face-to-face -face interaction that really makes a difference. Yeah. Because you get such a greater sense of of where the project is and getting that input from different people and i always end up walking away a lot more motivated as well after speaking with those people yeah i think yeah. it can be incredibly motivating um and it's i think it's always enriching right because if you're in your own domain right where you know a lot and uh, you just do that then i i don't want to say that you stop learning right because there's there's always like stuff that that is added and that comes up and some fields are very deep, like HIV, where there's like tons and tons of knowledge. But um, generally speaking, if you have these kind of field crossing collaborations, uh, you, you learn a lot. Well, I certainly learned a lot from my chat with Matthias and we'll definitely have to get him back next year for an update on such exciting work. In the show notes, you can find links to Dennis Burton and Christian Anderson's lab here at Scripps, as well as the CVSB consortium. So I suggest you check out those and Matthias on social media. I'd just like to thank my friend today and you lovely folks for listening, of course. And remember to hit subscribe and leave a review. It really would be the perfect Christmas gift. So until 2019, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and have a wonderful new year. Take care.